do now is to get to the main business of the day and introduce you to Rufus May. And you've had some details of Rufus's background with the flyer that I hope some of you've got. Um, but Rufus has said to me he would like to be introduced as clinical psychologist and ex-psychiatric patient. Yes. Yep. And he's going to talk about understanding madness and recovery. Great. Great. I have one. Um, I wanted to start uh, with a bit of music. Um, so just bear with me while I set this up. And, uh,
um, <coughs> recover from crisis. And, um, and finally, I want to really focus also on the need that this is not just a personal journey, it's a political journey, and talk a bit about that. So, um, I thought I'd also start with, um, that was from New Zealand, by the way, that was uh, a guy, I think he's called himself a consumer, and made a song about his experiences. Um, there's quite a lot in there, it's quite interesting. Um, what I'd like to uh, just read you is a bit um, by Pat Deegan, who's another psychologist, she's like a mad psychologist, who's uh, <laughs> in America, based in America. He's <coughs> quite a similar history to me. At a young age, uh, 17, got a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and then uh, decided to prove the doctors wrong and uh, train herself up and try and change the system um, as a as a psychologist. Um, and this is from a talk she gave to um, some psychologists and just I'll read the first few lines really. The message I felt called to share was rather simple. Uh, people with disabilities are people. When we forget that people with disabilities share a common humanity with us, then the human is stripped from the human services and stages set for the emergence of the inhuman and the inhumane. The inhuman and the inhumane emerge from that rupture which occurs when one human being fails to recognize and reverence the humanity and the fundamental sanctity, sovereignty and dignity of another person. Such a rupture in mutual relatedness occurs often in the helping professions and for this reason helping professionals sometimes hurt rather than help people with disabilities. Too often the human service is dehumanized and depersonalized. Many people with disabilities refer to this special kind of hurt as spirit breaking or how the system tries to break your spirit. It kind of links into this idea really of the monologue because uh, what's really happened in the last 200 years is that we've built up a science of dividing people into them and us basically. But, uh, it was very important with industrialization and also um, the kind of philosophy of the time, the enlightenment, it's very important uh, to exclude the people who didn't fit in to a rational view of things, to an individual ideal self. People who didn't fit into that model of the hardworking individuals, um, it was felt necessary to exclude them. Uh, so that uh, society could be more productive and more rational, perhaps even controlled. So uh, this is something um, that recently two psychiatrists, Phil Thomas and Pat Bracken, have written about in the British Journal of Psychiatry. So uh, that's my credibility. <laughs> but, uh, they, um, yeah, they, they talk about uh, really over the last 200 years, it's been really important. But the psychiatrists, if you like, were designated as the gatekeepers and needed to kind of um, describe the otherness of the, of the individual. But what, what, from my experience as a patient, what, what kind of happened was that you got this them and us kind of situation where the patient becomes somebody who is more to be observed and quantified rather than to be understood as a, as a similar human being. I mean, uh, which, Pat Deegan talks about disability. I think we've all got disabilities. Um, but, uh, you know, some of us are more aware of our disabilities. Others are more, have been made to be more aware. Isn't that a fact that the person with a psychotic uh, episode or manic depressive episode has in fact uh, brought that attitude about by him, not him making it them and us. I mean, most manics and psychotics think that they are all right and everyone else is just grey ash. Mm. Uh, you know, in other words, um, that they, they dehumanise other people. 
and therefore make themselves socially acceptable by disregarding and disrespecting the um, rights of everyone else to get on quite quietly. You know, they rock the boat. I'm speaking in my own case, but I really thought that I was some undiscovered genius and everyone else was crap, you know. Right. There were all these wankers and then there was me. And so I definitely needed subdued and the awareness was not from the ones treating me, mm. that I was an individual, but what they had to make me aware of was that they were individuals. Mm. And so if one is socially unacceptable, then one definitely needs treatment. Right. You know, no matter how uh, clever or elite you feel. I mean, the way you were treated sounds very positive, and what often happens is that uh, people aren't connected with, and I think people do get disconnected in lots of different ways. I think there's no one way to describe psychosis, because often it's about not fitting into a particular social setting. Yeah. So I, I get a bit, um, <coughs> I wouldn't like to say this is what psychosis is, you know, your description of your own experiences. Is, is one style, if you like. I find a common denominator. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I know my family are people with mm. mental health, and most of them are, um, are deluded that they are uh, extraordinary special people. And the only way I'm getting cured and getting a bit sane is to be a person among people, mm. you know, just to realize that uh, I have. Um, I have a right to be there, but I have the right to, um, to rule the world, you know. Yeah. And, and most of our delivery... I guess I would, I would agree rule. with you, but I would argue that to, for you to come back to the social world, that they need, people need to try and connect with you and, and uh, to give you feedback about your behaviour and how that's making other people feel and, and uh, get into a dialogue. And what I'm saying that traditionally had has happened in many services um, is that people have been seen as the, the main treatment is purely biomedical and they're left to kind of get on with it. In my experience, that just made things worse because I was I was kind of isolated. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I left it, I thought, well nobody's challenging my ideas. Um, so they must be right. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I built on those ideas. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm not um, suggesting that you know people don't need to develop and, and change. You know, when when they're mad, you know, obviously they need help and they need uh, sometimes uh, containment. And, but what I'm saying is, it needs to be negotiated, not sort of done to the person, which is traditionally what's happened. There hasn't been enough negotiation. Too often, coercion is used, and and when you start using coercion, you start to get this then and us. <coughs> ideas and it's very strong in mental health services where I work amongst um, the nurses who uh, would like to, perhaps many of them would like to be engaging in a much more meaningful way but the way the whole system is structured it's much more about treatment, control, keeping people on the ward, mm -hmm. keeping them on the meds, uh, <coughs> not really negotiating enough about their care and not, not, giving, not making a democratic process. We've got a very undemocratic process going on in mental health services in general. And there are good services mm. in general. I think the best help I got was the 12 step recovery program. Right. Where you do it in groups and you learn to be, uh, as I say, person among people. Whereas I date back to when they put me in straight jackets when I was mm. your age, you know. Um, Imagine putting a manic depressive and a manic episode in a straitjacket to help him. <laughs> and he's got a yeah. hive of bees trying to get out. He says to him, I've had some terrible treatment like that. But I think the only way is, is, I don't know if you know the 12 step recovery program, is just looking at your character defects, discussing with people with similar characters, because there's a character defect. If, for instance, I went to a meeting once and they said, anything that's worrying you, you can take it out here. Mm. So I took my willy out and I said, it's worrying me, it's bothering me. And uh, you see, that's socially unacceptable. Mm. They're no good saying, well, he's, uh, 
no, he's got a right to do that. <laughs> Because you have to think of all that. Well, I would say the way of expecting it is challenging you yeah. and giving you feedback that you need to be behave more responsibly and how your behaviour is affecting other people. So treat you as an equal rather than saying, oh, well, he's not responsible, he's very unwell, <laughs> you know, better at giving more medication, which can happen quite a lot. I think. Okay, uh, yeah. I've seen, I mean, over the years, I've, I've been in and out of hospital you know, quite a lot of times. And, and Thank goodness, really, but you know, in the last few years, I've seen a dramatic change in the in the, the nurse attitude. And being a um, or being a sort of client of the services or use of the services, you know, I think it's absolutely wonderful. But now, you know, the hospitals and the services are getting more uh, uh, needs led, you know, to, to, to the actual person themselves. Yeah. Yeah. When I first went into hospital, if you put a clean shirt on every day, then you do really well, <laughs> you know? Um, but now, you know, people begin to realise that people are individuals. And, and, and I think it's wonderful what, you know, the, the, the way it's going now. Yeah. 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 Um, um, aren't there cases where it might be difficult to engage a, a, a user, particularly when they are in a psychotic episode? Um, you know, the, the choices and the involvement, and, and that it can be difficult can't it? because you know the, the awareness maybe is not there, and um, the choices to be you know if, if you're going to give choices. That, the understanding of the choices. Um, well, I've certainly found that um, when I've worked with people who are quite sort of mad, you can still reason to some extent. Um, and you can give people feedback and say, look, you haven't slept for four days. This is, you've just thrown a chair. You know, you're clearly stressed out. You need to rest. You know, uh, you know perhaps you could take some medication to just help you sleep this time, you know, negotiate that. I'm not in that situation where I have to negotiate to help some take some medication because otherwise they're going to get accufates, you know. So they didn't have much of a choice really how to take it on in the injection. But um, as it happens, I've persuaded them to take that and probably and then the nurses led them off to give them accufates anyway because they've already set up to do it. Yeah. And so I, I actually think there's a lot of more room for negotiation than is a I can't say on every, in every case you must never use you know, some level of force to contain something to protect them. But all I know is we haven't tried hard enough to do it in, in a much more negotiation based way. So, um, well, that's the dangerous part because I've seen that when they've tried this that um, some nurses have been punched in the face and all. Now she was on about four foot six and, and they were letting this chap act it out, so to speak. Mm. And the next thing he would smash the face and not to get to him. So I mean, at times I've had male nurses sit on me to restrain me and I thank them for it. Mm. In fact, I remember saying, if I was you, I wouldn't know what to do with me either. Mm. He said, now you're beginning to. Now you're beginning to understand. They let me leave <coughs> and I was already kept. So there's a bit of both. I, I don't want to, the only reason I come in is I don't want it to swing to this um, way that school teachers have done. You know, there's no discipline in schools now, so the tail is wagging the dog. I mean, you know, the, the, um, the teacher comes in and says, just call me Bob, I'm one of you. The next thing, he has to go in next door to get a, a disciplinarian in to control his class who are climbing over the wall because he has gone with this trendy idea of uh, we're all equals, teacher, pupil. It's not. Teachers need pupils, adult, children need adults, mm -hmm. sick people need nurses. And as I say, the necessary restraint is, is still absolutely necessary to my mind. And that, as I say, I've come from the other school. Um, 
I think that one of the things you're making me think about is that when people act out, as you say, one of the problems is that they're not treated as responsible people. They're not treated as having responsibilities as well as rights. And, and so therefore, for me, the only way to be powerful when I didn't have any other access to any other power, uh, no choices, couldn't leave, couldn't go for a run, couldn't exercise, um, etc. Um, yeah, the only way to be powerful uh, was to be mad, to be challenging, to be difficult, to uh, tell nurses exactly what I thought of, you know, or tell people on the ward exactly what I thought of. Because that was the only way I could retain some sense of autonomy. So I, I actually think that uh, the emphasis on uh, compulsion and um, doctor knows best is actually very damaging. So I would disagree with you. But, but, but you know, I think it's good healthy to have a dialogue like this. I think, yeah, you need a balance between yeah, containment and this. confinement. Because if they let me out... At the moment, we've got too much confinement. Mm. If they let me out at the time when I was being violent, mm. I'd have been violent out the street if they'd said, oh, just go out. Mm. No, and then you've got freedom. Yeah. I mean, I don't want autonomy if I am bloody back in my head. I want, I want, you know, uh, to be disciplined if I ever go mad again. Right. Because we, we are not, we are not, the nature of madness is one is not rational. Therefore, you can't say he's just like me, he's a rational person, let him do it. You know, I know that you're saying about the old style of nursing, it was terrible. But this trendy thing is very similar to in the, in the schools. If it goes the other way, you're going to have a little bit of, uh, it's as dangerous to go this other kind of, hey, let's all be equal human beings. You're not bloody equal when you're mad. <coughs> that's, uh, that's the definition of the word madness. You're not rational. Right. Okay, um, I just want to comment that of um, acting out and being judgmental, for example, on the ward. Because um, mental illness is one of the uh, human phenomena that cannot be explained sometimes because there's a danger, especially nowadays, because of so many things that have happened in the community. And um, I'm glad that most units are working as a multidisciplinary team because you get different views, you get the view of the patient, you get the view of even the family and every, everybody else. <coughs> there are certain instances where, when uh, judgment even from the psychiatry, even from nurses, has been very, very, very bad. And the person, for example, is let out from leave let's say you are assuming you are still on the wall, is let out on, on leave, and they go out and commit a crime or some, some damage or something detrimental to his health, and also in view of the Mental Health Act can be very damaging to the health system of that national um, health service trust for that, um, for that hospital. And so it's to be very, um, to generalize for every situation and every patient can be very damaging. You know? But I quite agree that um, <coughs> as people move in the community, as we assess and people are tried and the patient, if they are insisting, I'm well, I know what I'm talking about, I think, um, the service should be open to the user, more open to the user. And if resources permitted, uh, monitor and support closely so that the person develops their self-esteem, they, instead of acting out, you know, they actually develop into a, more, a person who will be um, in the environment who actually contribute to his own living in one way or another. 
But to generalize about acting out and things like that, it's very difficult to judge when a person is really acting out. Well, I think we've got too much emphasis on risk, actually. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ward in Bradford where they actually um, stopped over a year, stopped all the types of observations um, with the patients, um, more or less completely. And uh, they reduced um, violent incidents on the ward. There's a lot more meaningful activities going on between staff and patients. Um, staff, uh, patient abscondence has gone down by a third, I think. And staff abscondence, I sick believe, has gone down by 50%. So I think that we're kind of all very frightened by all the headlines, which very much distort the problem of dangerousness and mental illness. Um, and uh, it's very powerful uh, you know, because 75% of the headlines focus on that and they blow it up out of all proportion. Uh, the association between mental illness and dangerous isn't very big at all, actually. And, um, but you wouldn't think so from the headlines. And, you know, killings by patients has gone down since care in the community was introduced, not up. But the atmosphere on the wards, the emphasis on risk training, all the forms you have to fill out, actually make you think differently and make you think that you're dealing with very dangerous people. You start to treat people as constantly as dangerous. Again, you're dehumanising them. And uh, I would also say, again, that you need to, once you start giving people that responsibility for their behaviour, then they're going to behave more responsibly. But if we're kind of watching them for every move, then you stop engaging with them as an equal. Um, <coughs> I wanted to say a little bit about, move on to the kind of categories really. I think they're very powerful at keeping things the way they are as well. The diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, there was a psychiatrist yesterday who was saying, he, 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 was, uh, he, he said, um, I'm not sure if I'm even quoting him, he said, um, let's not assume that uh, the label on the jar tells us anything about what's in the jar. Well, I would say let's give it a <coughs> label then, if it doesn't tell you anything about it. Um, and schizophrenia is a very good example of that. It's a blanket term. If you hear voices, you can get diagnosed as schizophrenia. If you're catatonic, you can get diagnosed as schizophrenia. If you have unusual ideas that don't fit in to your family's view or the community's view, you can get diagnosed as schizophrenia. And it, it's very, um, it doesn't explain a person's problem. So everybody's experiences are unique to them and you really need to sit down and work out the whole history, what's going on. Uh, psychiatrists are very good at taking history but then they don't try and make sense of it with the client. Yeah. Uh, so there's very good evidence to suggest that uh, a lot of psychotic reactions are reactions to trauma, to different types of trauma and alienation and, and the high prevalence of uh, psychosis and psychotic type diagnosis in the African Caribbean community will point to that as well as the, the, the pressures of racism and uh, alienation from that, of being a black person in a white country like Britain uh, contribute as a, as a stressor, a significant stressor towards developing psychosis so, uh, or psychotic type presentations. So, uh, but we, we miss all that with the present way of thinking about um, psychosis, which very much just takes a snapshot of people in the here and now. Are they hearing voices? Yes. Are they um, behaving bizarrely? Yes. And, you know, and, and then, okay, they've got this, and then it seems an explanation. They say, well, we think he's, he's got schizophrenia, and everyone, ah, oh, right. Well, then we do this, and this, and this. And we stop trying to understand the individual, and where they're coming from, and, and what their potentials are as well. We then move into, it becomes the hopeless diagnosis as well. There's all sorts of assumptions about schizophrenia that um, it's associated with a gradual deterioration of social functioning. And um, since, since the time of Kreiplin, that those assumptions have stayed, even though the evidence is the opposite. There's a huge diversity of outcomes from people who get diagnosis of schizophrenia. 
uh, there's still this kind of doom from the womb idea about uh, schizophrenia, psychosis, but particularly schizophrenia. You know, <coughs> as soon as you get along towards that end of diagnosis, people start lowering their expectations about this person's abilities, strengths, potential, and um, so I, I would very much suggest that we need to scrap these terms and, and look for a better way of understanding people that, that's much more tailored to that individual in their context and their family and their, their experiences. I'm lucky enough to be working as well as being a major depressive but I do get psychosis, that's why I came. But uh, what the latest thing that happened to me in February was a psychosis but unfortunately I went into work on one of the days of the psychosis and my own understanding about other people really it's this thing they fear because they don't understand mm -hmm. I'm talking about you know, my peers that I work with without all the things that I have to go through with mm -hmm. the next time it happens I've got to be as careful as anything not to go in or but uh, what would really be a good solution to that? Uh, ideally well it, ideally is for me to be even more aware of it but okay, okay. given that you might occasionally misjudge it yeah. I was wondering if there was would it be useful to educate to your colleagues to have a better understanding that's what I was thinking hopefully that's that's what I've had to do. I've right. had to give a lecture, right. a, a staff meeting, and things like that. So there is the line manager is being helping to educate those people, and I'm not and I'm not giving me the sack because I've done these various things. Uh, but uh, you know, because we are learning people, the most of the people I've known, we're always questioning. Uh, so we try to make it back in any case because we want something more as well as being uh, being not disregarded. And it's very brave yeah. to say get out and to do this education yeah. process yeah. Yeah. as well. Because because what we're left with with the ghettoisation of a kind of mental health problems is that the rest of society doesn't understand. No, yeah. well, that's what I'm saying. It's a fear of yeah. understanding. And, and there is this whole fear that stops people from right. understanding. Right. As well. well, because one of the uh, one of the women that was a, uh, there's a two tier management. There's a uh, uh, leader in charge and the line manager. But the leader in charge, that person has known me for something like that, nearly. 11 to 18 years and she had the cheek to turn around and say I was a threat to the kids you know for this one instant incident yeah well here's getting better used to be instant dismissal yeah. but that's what I'm saying there's no kids around at the time <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, so cool little outburst mm -hmm. and yet it's very acceptable well, it's a lot more acceptable for somebody to just be very angry and work with an inferior member of staff. Mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. acceptable. So, uh, you know, I, yeah, I think that it is, you know, very bravely doing something that we need to do is educate the community. And that's going to have to happen because, you know, the asylum no longer is behind the walls and the asylum is in society. Mm -hmm. I think what we've got to educate is the, uh, are the sufferers, people like myself. Because it's all right when I'm having a, a time, I'm, I'm well now for three and a half years. But I've got to be aware that these uh, episodes happen and have happened throughout my life since I was 21. And I think more of, uh, of these, uh, like I go to Alcoholics Anonymous, because alcohol was one of my. My, one of my fixes. Um, and I've had more help from that. And more of that, if you had schizophrenic uh, groups, we've tried one in Stepping Stones, which is working quite well, but unfortunately, only about four of us turn up to, sometimes in five. But we can discuss 
you know, there's a chap desperately trying to hang on to his mind depression because he thinks it makes him interesting and, and attractive and uh, Maybe it does. is simplistic. Uh, and I'm desperately trying to lose mine. Right. And so discussing it with fellow sufferers, you have to walk to walk to talk to talk, you know, uh, because other people wouldn't know what you're on. Right. And uh, you well, know, yeah. I think it's good. One of my best skills is no longer thinking that I'm an, I'm an undiscovered genius, you know. And it took a breakthrough of years and years of this delusion and, and grandiosity, uh, uh, and, and which was which was estranging me from a fellow man, you know, okay. uh, and and so I had to, you know, and that only came from discussing with other sufferers. Yeah. And what you clearly got when you're demonstrating is very from probably doing this, you know, it's very coherent way of talking about your experiences. And a lot of people don't have that because they don't have the opportunity to sit around with other people who've had similar experiences yeah. and similar experiences of hospitalisation. And so yeah, I'm very pro recovery groups and I think there's a lot we learn from AA and NA, you know, because mm -hmm. they're very successful, you know, and um, prolific. And, um, yeah. I think uh, there's a lot to be learned from self-help groups and something I'm very interested in promoting. Um, okay, so it brings me on to the idea of uh, recovery, which um, is very much used in uh, these kind of self-help groups we're talking about. Um, you might not be able to see that, but um, <coughs> it's a flexible term, and it doesn't mean cure. Um, it's come out of a uh, disability movement in America as much as anything else, this, this term. And um, that... Uh, so that Pat Deegan, for example, is compared to her recovery to, to that of um, a, a paraplegic who was able to rebuild his life. And he, he was very despairing about his abilities after a motorbike accident, I think it was, and had given up, basically. And then she, talks, she compares her own recovery to his about, about how it, they slowly um, reclaimed some hope and, and slowly started to um, build in meaningful activities and, learn skills and find ways to cope with the difficulties that they had. And um, just a couple of quotes here. Recovery vision looks at the whole person from their point of view. It focuses on people's strengths, hopes, wishes and achievements as well as ways to cope with difficulties. So um, similarly, Ron Coleman, who's a kind of big recovery guru almost uh, in this country. For some of us, recovery means learning to cope with our difficulties, getting control over our lives, achieving our goals, developing our skills and fulfilling our dreams. So he still hears voices. You know? so he's, but he's found a way to make sense of that and build around that a very meaningful life, a very successful life, actually. So I think he was in The Express last week as a successful businessman. That's quite funny. What did you do? I'm in the hybrid initial in The Express this week. David, <laughs> 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 like, what did you do about the line between hopes, wishes and achievements and delusions of, of grandiose nature, you know, of a grand bois, you know. Um, well, I mean, because th th this is an area that can keep you sick for years if you've got grandiosity uh, inappropriate to your abilities. Well, yeah, you've got to find out what you want to keep from that and what you want to leave behind. I mean, there might be some really useful things about and, and there might be some really disadvantaging aspects to those aspirations. I mean, I certainly look back and see some of my um, kind of more bizarre ideas as quite useful. They gave me hope. They gave me a sense that I could achieve something. I look like a 30-foot 30, 30 canvas, <laughs> as well as with the grandiose I appear, but I can't afford it. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's my... You know, because the things are smaller, but uh, yeah, because I have been working on sort of ten foot bits of paper or so, yeah. so I can be grandiose in that one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's finding a socially acceptable yeah. way to challenge, yeah. to channel yeah. these, these yeah. Uh, feelings, thoughts, emotions. Yeah. And I found drama really useful for that, mm -hmm. and dullness to some extent. Yeah. 
you dance all night, you know, and that's socially acceptable, as long as you're in a club or something. <laughs> <laughs> I made a lot of money, actually, but I, I paid the price. I sat and, you know, I had people shoving needles up my ass and sitting in my head. But I made a lot of money as a cartoonist because I had to be way out there where they were terrified to get the cartoons. And then I lost reality. Yeah. And so therefore, I, um, I, I couldn't, you know, um, cope with mundane activities yeah. and do this. And so I, I lost out and ended up locked up. I mean, the challenge is to get the balance. I mean, yeah. I, I spoke to a guy on the phone about because of the media work that I've done, I get quite a lot of people phoning me to ask for help with their relatives, often knocking a lot of mums phoning me telling me to help my son. And I don't do private work, but I ended up talking to this guy on the phone and he said to me, I, I think you've lost your heightened awareness. <laughs> and maybe I have, you know, and maybe that's a sacrifice that I've had to make, you know, that we, um, that, you know, there are costs and benefits. You know, I'm not going to glamorise. Uh, psychosis, so I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, it, that's where he was coming from. And that is the fear, that's why I didn't want to take medication. Yeah. Because I thought I'd lose my age. We have to negotiate our way. You know? yeah. I, I like to think I've got some of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right, a couple of things. I mean, the kind of uh, the dogma, the monologue I've talked about. Um, I mean, it's largely, you know, framed as biomedical psychiatry, but you can see the whole mental health system a bit involved in that, really. Um, and, and, and society, really, this kind of social exclusion that's historically happened. Um, because of that very strong ideology I've been talking about, we haven't looked at what helps people recover nearly enough. Uh, it's assumed that if somebody rebuilds their life or does well, that they've got something different. But they didn't have skills. You know. The pool shifts all the time and stays as the hopeless diagnosis. You can't, uh, because of this kind of deterministic type of thinking, and negative thinking. But I, I much, I prefer to see people's mental health as much more an evolving story that uh, is very much influenced by um, how people respond around the, the person, and, and as well what the person themselves does. So. Um, and it's very important to look at people's recovery accounts. And looking at, I've looked at some people's recovery accounts, and, and here are some of the things that start to come out, really. And they're, they're things that are good for life. You know, these are not. Uh, this is not rocket science. Um, the importance of supportive others, e.g., believing in the individual's potential for recovery. That, that's always important. Um, there's always one person who stood by the person who's um, lying about how they've um, rebuilt their lives from crisis. Uh, hope, as I've, I've really talked about that a lot, and um, what I find really useful uh, sometimes is just to read client stories, uh, recovery stories, and that can really um, lift them, basically. Because it, it is, um, these stories have been hidden for many, many years. And, and they're like gold, they're very valuable. Uh, a coherent account of one's experiences. I think there's been a danger in mental health services we had talking about insight. Uh, it's this one way of seeing things that's a superior way, a kind of rational, medical, sometimes psychological view. And, and uh, it's the person doesn't have this, they're kind of doomed for, really. And uh, uh, from looking at people's accounts, it's not. It seems more, it, it can't have to be coherent, but it can be in any particular belief system. You need some social currency, but you can have a spiritualist way of making sense of your experiences. Uh, and that can allow you to move on, as long as, you've got, as long as you can exchange it with other people, and they, they don't look at you like you're you know, an alien. Um, so that, that's really important for people to make sense of their experiences, and I think you know, self-help groups are very good places to do that. Um, spiritual beliefs came up as important in lots of people's accounts. And um, often that historically is seen as sort of lack of insight. If someone's, you know, kind of uh, 
seen as a symptom almost, a religious maniac. And, and, and yet, it, I actually found um, spiritual practice very helpful, and actually I found churches, um, I'm not that religious now, although I was saying I still have strong spiritual beliefs, um, I found um, churches much less judgmental about me. And uh, then uh, there was a local Methodist church that let me speak from the pulpit and stuff, you know, and help, let me uh, set up a, a youth club. Okay. And um, they, they trusted in me, and that was very helpful to me, actually. But, um, and as you've been describing, well, uh, you know, these are quite fantastic experiences. Sometimes you need a fantastic theory to help explain them. Um, Self-esteem. I've got a little bit um, of a problem with this term. I'm kind of, I'm, I've been trained in a very um, postmodern way, and so we, I prefer the idea of positive stories. But basically, yeah, people listening, it's clear that people have needed to listen to stories that help them view themselves in a more positive way. So, um, and sixthly. Um, Recovery can't be done to someone. You can't, uh, the person has to take an active role in it uh, and start taking responsibility. You know? So this self-management you were talking about um, and, and monitoring, you know, it's obviously an important part and, and the person being educated in ways that help to cope. You know? So I've been really impressed with the Hearing Voices Network and uh, there's a whole range of coping strategies people um, use. There's no one way to deal with the experience of hearing voices. I actually didn't hear voices uh, very much, um, but um, there's a whole um, range of coping strategies from spending an hour each day focusing on the voices to uh, distraction techniques to engaging with voices and trying to make sense of them and in terms of your life and, and important emotional um, experiences in your life. So. Uh, it's, it's like trying to get out of London. There's no way, one way to do it. Or <laughs> <laughs> getting out probably. <laughs> but since you know, since we've had the earphones, huh? since we've had the earphones, just cassette players, right? That was the greatest thing that ever happened. Right. Because I could shut things off. Yeah. To, and just be. So, so that is one thing that came. Uh, Come, mm. look, can do, but I get quite shocked when, you, when people turn around and say, "Are oh, you hearing voices?" Mm. But I haven't so far. But, but the last uh, uh, psychosis I've had, it's been so far. It's been the ones that I can remember is every four years the psychosis. But I depend on music a lot, not only for when I'm painting, but also to get me out of part of my recovery. Mm. Is that uh, you know, is, that is the road I tread? You know? mm. so, does yeah. that make sense? It's or? really worth documenting, yeah, yeah because this, this is really valuable kind of information. Yeah. Some people find it really useful to drown out the voices. Yeah. Other people yeah. find it more useful to focus on. Them. It's good to have a whole set of coping strategies, and traditionally we just try to stop them, to <coughs> drown them out with yeah. sort of highly sedating medication. Yeah. And also, when you're in a man, Jake can understand this, when you're in a man situation, is you turn the volume down, but with the earplugs and everything, you can have the volume up and not trouble other people, right? Can't you? So. Mm -hmm. I just to turn the tape over. Excuse me. I was talking um, at Core Arts yesterday. Do you have any problems with that? Very good arts project in Hackney. <coughs> um, and you and yours ended up interviewing me. So I might be on you and yours right now. The revolution will not be televised, it will be on you and yours. So, <laughs> so 
the thing I've said about um, about patients and, and recovery, um, I'd prefer to call them patients, well it's technology. <laughs> Even schizophrenia. Yeah, I don't care if, it, if they call it deadly weights or schizophrenia, it doesn't, the word doesn't bother me. Uh, but they, they all think, well, have a wee smoke of, smoke of wacky wacky, or have a few pints today, or have a couple of cans of beer. And I know it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but I don't think anybody will ever get well from any of these bloody things if they're still encouraged to relax <coughs> with, um, with the mind altering substances, you know. No matter how, I'm not talking about alcoholics, I'm not talking about junkies, I'm talking about people who think they can relax with uh, mind altering substances while they're on, on medication. Uh, I've noticed them staying sick for years just because they like the wee smoke and they like the wee the couple of cans of lager. I, I think there's not enough said about, about drugs uh, and alcohol being a drug. You know, two people when they're leaving and when they're when they're at things, you know. And they don't have drugs at the function, eh, or alcohol at the functions we have. But it seems to be quite acceptable if people think they can eh, relax that way or get some sort of ease from these things because uh, it's absolute liquid madness, powdered madness, you know. Um, so I, I, I definitely think that if some of the people here are advising them and they say, what do you have? Oh, I just have a couple of special brews every night. It would be a bad idea to advise them not to and try their life without them mm. and see whether they get a bit more peace of mind. Anyway, that's just my hobby was. You've talked a lot about making sense of experiences, but you've not said very much about distress. I've got an overhead for that. <laughs> it's not stage, I didn't know that. <laughs> right. I appreciate it, but I didn't know about it until just now. Um, I mean, I personally you know, think a lot of distress is about the social exclusion people experience and the loneliness and the kind of um, becoming a social outcast you know, and seen as a you know you're seen as a moral outsider and a genetic outsider you know, and it's, it's like an apartheid system that we've got and I think that, that can really attack your morale you know, and stop you looking at your strengths and feeling good about yourself so I think that a big part of distress comes from that, but also obviously the experiences can often be very distressing. And um, I mean, uh, I've been very interested in Maris Rom and Sandrisha's work linking, say, voice hearing with trauma, and, and seeing um, very much a strong link. I think they found uh, in a clinical sample, I think it was 90% of people who were hearing voices. Um, they were first triggered or seemed to be closely following on from a traumatic event. And um, they all, Sandra Isha has done some work with children who hear voices mm -hmm. and has found that, um, that uh, there seems to be a link between a, a very tra traumatizing event that's caused some emotional conflict. And if you can help the child resolve that, like often the voice hearing becomes much more manageable. In many cases, disappears completely. I think they found that over a four-year period, 60% uh, of the children uh, stopped hearing voices. So there seems to be a natural healing process going on. Um, and they, they were keen to um, dissuade the pharmaceutical industry and uh, the more biomedical psychiatrists who want to intervene early with drugs. And they say this might actually slow down the natural healing process. Um, so, um, and Maris Rom in talking about this and, and the, the people may be kind of um, re experiencing traumatic events as a, as a way of trying to cope with them. The, 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 it's like many people's psychotic experiences may be a way of dissociating from a very difficult set of emotional experiences. Um, he points to Lewis Herman's work um, 
that describes some stages where in, in, in recovery from trauma that you need a healing relationship. It's like a bereavement process where you need a safe place. You need to do some remembrance and mourning about the, the traumatic events. And, um, and then that allows you then to reconnect um, in a less dissociative style with your thoughts and feelings and, and with the world, the wider world. Um, But I don't think there's one way, and I think this is useful for some people to, to, to do this, to make sense of their experiences in terms of linking it to trauma. And other people don't want to do that. But this is a way of coping, is to dissociate sort of thing. And I certainly don't relate to this myself, particularly, that I've found my way of getting out of my uh, distressing situation was to find meaningful activities and find a meaningful social role. So, what um, what has always disturbed me about the lack of availability of a space to explore all these different possibilities leads to what you began with really. Yeah. And being able to withstand the kind of uncertainty and lack of under lack of comprehension of people's mental health and its expression leads to a closing down so that people aren't given the space to explore whether it's this, or whether it's the way Jed's found useful, the way I might find useful, or somebody else. There, there are, there's such a shortage of available personnel to do that, and resources within the health service. And it, it's quite scandalous, really, because what, what's happening is that one way of looking at the world is being sustained at the expense of providing opportunity to explore other ways of looking. Well, I've got to be very grateful, I do realise, of my line manager as such, mm. because she wants to understand mm. and make the other people that I'm mm. working with mm. understand. So that's an enlightenment in itself, isn't it? Yes, you're very lucky to have that. So. Yeah. That is growing. It's growing sometimes because of personal efforts like yours. But I think it also she even going to come to that because of the efforts of people who are working in mental health services should be out there helping people protect those spaces where they can be understood and gain understanding, not just working inside clinics. Um, I know there is a huge problem with staff resources and time mm. that just aren't enough to be there. But I was wondering, earlier you on when you were talking about diagnoses and where that takes us, um, where, whether the greater shortage is of, of time or skills? Because I think diagnosis is a really easy way to not have to develop quite complex skills in working with people and exploring all these options and uh, taking the, you know, huge responsibility of this healing relationship role and the, and the support of other role and, and everything else. I think what tends to happen is that people get trained in an approach. Yeah. Whereas we also need some people who are not so affiliated to an approach, but to the notion of exploration, but within safe boundaries. And that, that requires a very different way of training professionals and supporting them. Mm -hmm. so that they feel that they're allowed to operate with those rather loose boundaries and not have to stick within some people say the tyranny of the evidence base. I mean, I, I actually think the only way to change things is, mm -hmm. is to step outside the system to some extent and that's something I've set up, something in town, it's called the Grassroots Project. It's really a community project, community psychology project where I'm kind of an ally to self-help groups that want to get established and uh, we aim to have a hearing voices group and uh, an active question self-help group and possibly a recovery group coming in the next few months and they're basically in, in some sense deprofessionalizing mm -hmm. um, and with the idea that because what I found really useful is I've learned from the hearing voices network so that these then can these can be resources also to educate the workers inside, but that might be 
a way forward in trying to change um, the way. Because although it, we say it's complex, it's also common sense. You know, that people's distress is linked to their life experiences. And that, 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 that people's madness means something. I mean, it is, um, you know, common yeah, sense. That, that sermon hit me like a ton of bricks mm. uh, in the morning because my um, visit after 16 years of, of health, uh, I found myself in farm and it was when my brother and sister both died uh, uh, within about three weeks of one another. And my sister was like the mother in her house, and my brother was my best pal. And they just both died at that, and I got in touch with my own mortality. And then, but I didn't grieve, I didn't mourn. And uh, you know, I, I absolutely was numb to it. And in fact, I think I cried yesterday for the first time. And if somebody could get me through this kind of recovery eh, from trauma, and, and help you to get in touch with remembrance and mourning. I mean, that had a ton of bricks that uh, the, these ways of recovering from trauma. And you see, nobody tells you these things. And, mm. and uh, it's all right, the staff knowing, but the patient should know as well. What you saying is very interesting. And I'm interested in the step even. saying that you got this being in your mind, you were going to show them, you were going to get the training and you could do it, and that let you touch your own energies and do that. Yeah. But when you have someone who, who won't even think of going to a group, of, uh, of there being any possibility of movement or change, seeing no direction, no light, there's a way to do it by building the healing relationship, which takes ages. I mean, you can do it if some people can do it. And if people are really distressed and really cut off, it can take a long time. The kind of time that professionals are no longer allowed. So I'm interested in what you might think press the pos not even the go button, but the button before the go button. For you. I don't know for me, because um, I was always fighting. Yeah. So, but for people who've given up, and that's a way of coping. If you if you feel that every avenue is blocked, and the easiest way to preserve yourself is just to give up and lower your expectations and enjoy the comforts of being cared for, <laughs> then, then, you know, you've got to be creative about how you try and encourage that person that's another way, and they've got to, you've got to build up trust. You've got to know that you, they've got to know you're not going to let them down. Um, you know, and I'm not going to profess to have all the answers. I wouldn't say be creative. And uh, you know, use recovery stories, you know, get, get people along to give talks and, you know, um, use different mediums, uh, the music, the creative stuff, you know, um, chit chat, anything, you know, connect with it, find a way to connect, you know, um, that's the best way I can answer. You've got to re-engineer that home for someone, so they've got to, they've also got to make that decision, so it's got to come from there. You can, Create an enabling environment, but they've got to do some work too. It's a, it's a two way and process. What if they don't? Huh? And what if they don't? What if they don't? Or can't, don't want to do it. Try harder, but increase their depot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think that, no, I think that's why they. <laughs> I think that's why the motive earlier. The motive earlier. Yeah. If you, be you depend on one person, give up. Don't give up on someone. Yeah, that's but if you depend on one person, or you try single-handedly to help one person, as one person, yeah. you're in a you need a team. 
He needed yeah. team in his bottom yeah. area. Yeah. And, and the relatives where there's love and there's people. But let's somebody off the hook. Because very often yeah. there's two need help. The one who's trying to help and the other. Yeah, I think there's too much. <laughs> that's a good problem. Emphasize me uh, on, on a sort of one-to-one -one therapeutic relationship. Yeah. You look at physical recovery stories. So, um, what's his name? Well, Dahl, the children's book <coughs> writer. Um, he, his wife, Patricia Neal, had a brain hemorrhage. And you know, she was reduced to the age, mental age of two, perhaps, and, and um, physically disabled. And what he did was recruit all his friends. Each one would come around in a different bay and do exercises with her. And through doing those exercises and all the social interaction that she got, she slowly, uh, she got a whole range of people uh, to learn from. Uh, and they worked in shifts so no one got exhausted. And, and, and everyone believed that she could re recover you know, uh, a lot of abilities, and she did. And I think there's a lot to learn from those stories, um, where in some ways the impairments may at first be more daunting, um, but, but, but there's more of a sense of hope in, in, in physical um, illness. A friend of the mother, and she tried it on her own, and the guy got worse, worse he got. She was an enabler, in other words. And recently she has let him down, and this has been a big shock to him yeah. because, um, you know, um, she's just a human being. She couldn't cope anymore. She had let him down. She had to go and get a flat on her own and leave her. And so, I mean, I think everybody's problem is everybody's problem. Yeah. Or anybody's problem yeah. is everybody's problem. Uh, and the only way we'll get some help is the more the better and the more loving people. I got tremendous help on Tuesday from people at Stenton stores. I had an exhibition I would have ended up in the nut house. It was so fraught and then people came and helped me. The job yeah. was I was busy and helping. And these are the people in it for money, these are people in it for uh, and they're not in it for putting up the ladder at the job. Yeah, so what people we're talking about people. is a circle of friends there. Yeah. And so I think it's really about rebuilding the community. People have better outcomes in developing countries than they do <coughs> in Western countries where people are very isolated and families are very isolated. Uh, and there's, there's more, there's, it's easier to reassume the role in a more communal society where people don't judge you so much and not so isolated. And you mean it's better than the world? Yeah, outcomes are better. And, yeah, in rural. I suppose they're praying for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. Um, I want. Oh. If I talk about it before, I think I think the most important thing of all is not to give up. Mm. Is to keep on trying mm. uh, and, and not to give up. Mm. Yeah. And I think well, stories, yeah. positive stories of recovery, help you not give up as well. Yeah. And the other people know what they've managed to achieve. So yeah, from a like like professional's perspective, I think it's also quite important. Not, not to be so arrogant as to think you're the only one who can do this type of mm. thing. Yeah. And to like actually to be able to give up and say, look, could a colleague, you know, maybe you get on better with certain so than I did. And yeah. I'm not feeling any shame in that. Who really different? Yeah, yeah. And to try and bring in friends and, and sure. see them that, that we can't be mm. that person mm. many of the times we cannot be that person who's sure. there for them unconditionally. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, thinking about my foster daughter, who's now 27, and she had a major um, mental health problem when she was 21. She's still coming out of it, but um, for years she self-harmed and was very, very unwell. But she then found a young man, got married to him, and it's been the accident trigger, and she's, she didn't actually get a great deal of help coming off the medication, I was a long way away from her, but she, you know, she used me very much as, as kind of helping her. But she needed a whole range of people. And because she's had that range of help, and the determination and the reason to do it, she's actually coming off her medication herself, very carefully, because she, she felt she wasn't actually getting the help to come off it from, from the professionals, because it was a bit too scary, you know, because she had self-harm for so long. And uh, she's actually, well, I mean, she's, she's, she's very, very there. She's, she's almost, almost there.
when they talk about recovery as an ongoing process, you know, never, it's not a station you quite get to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just got, I wanted to, I wanted to finish, or well, there was a big part, I think it was in my training, that I kind of leave the politics out, but I think politics is really important, and um, the, the, it's a real constraint against people rebuilding their lives in terms of the structures in society, and the discrimination people face in employment, uh, in insurance, housing, um, accommodation, education. There are real prejudices and real barriers to people rebuilding their lives and they need to be challenged on a political level. And as an, I say this as an activist, not just a psychologist. And, uh, we, um, but real campaigning is needed. There's a real kind of lethargy and complacency in society and in mental health about acting politically. And I really think we need to change that. If you look at any other civil rights movement, any other group <coughs> who managed to achieve change, they've had to really shout and really, and really um, take action you know, and, and, and for people to listen and for people in um, power to move over a bit. So you better give over some power here, otherwise we're going to lose like, quite a lot. So if you look at the women's movement on the civil rights, black civil rights movement, the gay movement, um, it's very important uh, to campaign and be vocal and, and active. And it's, um, the personal is political, it's clearly mental health. Uh, and it's, it's the one area that is it's still acceptable to use schizophrenic in a very derogatory term in the press or in the street. Or, or a lot of the other terms are no longer acceptable. It used to be um, commonly used you know, in terms of race or sexuality. Um, but, so we're still in the ghetto. And um, you know, I strongly encourage people um, to try and to, to have a political aspect to their recovery work and what they're what doing. Um, I mean, I organise a monthly meeting called Critical Mental Health. I'm involved in it, and it meets, it's London wide. And um, that's about users and professionals getting together and uh, thinking about change in the system. In the wider system. You know, we've got community treatment orders coming in, that's a very worrying trend. There are some very positive messages coming down from government, you know, very positive, holistic kind of rhetoric. There's also a worrying um, aspect which, which seems to be appealing to um, these very uh, conservative headlines, the kind of fear aspect, distorted media idea that dangerousness and mental illness go together hand in hand. Um, which is completely exaggerated. And, and um, we need to challenge that. I mean, community treatment orders are, are, are look like they may be coming in, and I'm very concerned about that. Uh, I'm more than concerned, I'm outraged. I want to protest about it. And um, there, is, there is going to be um, a protest in July, I believe, outside the uh, Royal College of Psychiatry about these kind of issues. And I think that's very important to raise awareness and it's another way of getting into the media as well but, but, so there's a group called Mad Pride and they've managed to get in it's a small group of people but they, they've organised an event last year that uh, 3,000 people attended in this old park and um, they managed to get um, quite good coverage in the media and that, that's another way of, of saying you know we're proud to be who we are you know, we're not ashamed um, we're not inferior so I've got some t-shirts, they're seven pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you can buy one for me at the end of the talk. And um, so I really think that, um, so to create a dialogue in mental health and in the wider society about recovery and about ways of understanding madness, uh, we need to speak up and cut through the fear and the complacency. And, and that that's very important, very hard to do and it um, takes a lot of courage, but it's very much well worthwhile. <laughs> it's a lot of W's. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and it will, because unless we do that, um, other people will make decisions about <coughs> the mentally ill. And, and, um, and the, the asylum will move from the hospital into the community. And, uh, 
that I'm very concerned about compulsory care because it goes against everything we're talking about, which is about doing things in partnership and people making decisions. You know, I think if somebody makes an informed decision to come off their medication, they should have the right to get, get support in that, to do it in the best way possible with, with, with the most chances of success and, then, and a good backup plan. But what happens now is it's seen as immoral almost to want to come off your medication. You know, um, and that's very undemocratic. I mean, we really need to challenge that. And uh, so I, I really believe you know, that recovery is a political process as well as a personal process. Thank you, Correct. Thank you. In the time or the fashion.